Welcome, everybody. Great, great to have you here. Great to have you here today. Great to be back. Uh, we're on vacation. Uh, we're up in Nova Scotia, and uh, we had a great the time on the, up in north of there. And uh, anyway, so uh, we're watching a little Tim Hawkins when we're up there, and I really appreciated the worship this morning. And uh, what I what Tim Hawkins was dealing with worship, you know, and hand raising. Are you from a hand raising church or not? And and it was really pretty funny. I really like him. He's out there. And he talked about, like this morning, I kind of wanted to raise my hands a little bit, and I'm kind of like this kind of, you know. And then he talked about carrying the small screen TV. And then it's the big screen. And then there's the, the little fish, and if you're a liar, the big fish hand raising. But anyway, just uh, it's interesting how we all kind of worship the Lord in different ways and express ourselves in different ways. And I wanted to uh, just, uh, there's a couple birthdays that are very special today. First is Dallas. We want to just uh, uh, say happy birthday to Dallas. I think he ran out. No, there he is. There he, but uh, happy birthday, Dallas, to you. And uh, let's give him a round of applause. I appreciate Dallas and leading the worship team. We're so blessed. Uh, as Carl was sharing this morning, uh, uh, you know, over the summer, attendance is kind of up and down in that. But boy, when you think of like eight, over 80-some people, families that are involved in serving in this church is really thrilling. So thank you to all of you. But also there's a, even a more special, not that yours isn't Dallas, but, but we have Carol Gill, who is 93 years, going to be 93 on what, Wednesday? Tuesday, sorry. Yeah, Tuesday. So happy birthday to you. And it's great to have her with us today. Uh, she hasn't been feeling well, but it's just great to have you here today. So uh, a couple other things I just want to pray about this morning. Uh, there is, uh, a, and we need to really pray about this, but uh, October 3rd is a women's fellowship and it's soup and salad. And so we need to be praying about that. Uh, women's fellowship and... Uh, Kim Dempsey is going to be our guest speaker. And um, so anyway, we just want to just start this morning off with a word of prayer and giving thanks and uh, just coming before our Father. Father, we thank you that you're a loving, caring God and how you work uh, in each and every one of our lives so uniquely and so special in such special ways. And thank you for these ones that we celebrate their birthdays this week, and uh, thank you for what they contribute to the body of Christ. And uh, Lord, just thank you for them and their faithfulness. And, and uh, Lord, for all the people who serve in this church, and for those who showed up at the church, uh, uh, the, the community fall festival and helped out there, Lord, we just pray you bless them. And Father, we thank you for this church that you've provided for us, this building that we can meet in and use all week long. And Thank you for the weather, Lord, the warm weather. Many of us have enjoyed it, and some of us uh, have wondering what is going on. And so, Lord, we do pray for all those who've gone through all these hurricanes and the earthquakes in Mexico and uh, fires and so many things, Lord. As we look around us, it's pretty amazing, Father, when we think of uh, the extent of uh, the tragedies that have happened. And, Lord, we thank you for how you've kept us safe, but we do lift up and pray for relief and help and comfort from around the world for these individuals. And Father, I pray that people who go through these difficulties, Lord, that they, if they don't know you, they would come to find you. And those who do know you, Lord, that you would encourage them by sending others alongside to help them through these difficult times. So Father, we just praise you. We thank you for what you're doing in and around us. Thank you for this beautiful morning we have together in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just wanted to thank Rick Bartu for preaching last week. I've heard some great things. Always great when I'm gone to have, have people step in. And Rick is teaching adult Sunday school and, and appreciate him and Jonelle. And so thank you, Rick, for your faithfulness in serving the Lord. Appreciate you so much. And uh, this morning we're, uh, we're going to pick up where we kind of left off an introduction to Ephesians. And uh, we're just going to hit the first point because that's all I got to last time, but some of you may have not been here, so we're going to touch base on, on that uh, again, and then we're hopefully going to get through the material this morning, but that's okay if we don't because Ephesians is such a great letter, and it is a letter that gives us so much instruction on practical theology, but as Paul starts out with these first three chapters, he deals and dives into some very important things. And Rick touched on some of these things last week, our position in Christ and who we are and, and how God sees us. He doesn't see us as sinners. 
He sees us as his children who've been redeemed by the blood of his son and have been now declared sinless. And so we are before a holy and righteous God seen as sinless because of Christ's work on the cross. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is some of the greatest truth you'll ever know or ever hear in your life, to know that you have been forgiven, to know that that God has, has his hand on you, that you've been adopted into his family. And so all these blessings we have in Christ are so significant. So this morning, the title of my message again is All In. We are all in Christ who know him, but are we all in? And and I will explain what that means. So the spiritual blessings we have in Christ, verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus by the will of God. So Paul was chosen, Christ appeared to him. He had a miraculous uh, conversion and uh, went from being a persecutor, a destroyer of the church, and protecting Judaism to somebody who was known in the New Testament as one of the most significant individuals in the New Testament who wrote the majority of the New Testament and gave us such a great foundation of truth than which we can stand on, which ultimately transforms our lives. He goes on to say, to the saints in Ephesus, set apart saints. And, and I mentioned last time that you're either a saint or you're an ain't. You're either in Christ and you belong to him, you've been sanctified and set apart, or you don't know Jesus Christ, you are not a saint, you are separated and you're destined to eternity in hell without coming to a realization of who Christ is. So you're either in Christ or you're not. You're either a saint or you're not. To the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, this grace and peace is something that can only be accomplished because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Grace that he gives us, his steadfast love, that forgiveness, and then that peace that we can only have because we stand forgiven and we stand as sinless in the presence of a holy and righteous God. That is the only thing that can give us true peace in this life. The only thing. You can have peace in in different manners, but not in the spiritual realm other than in Christ. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what transforms us into living extraordinary lives. Grace and peace to you from our God and our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And What that means is that there is nothing greater, there can be no greater uh, gift, there can be no greater joy, there can be no greater peace, there can be no greater place in the world no matter what you do for a living or what kind of a family you came from or whatever your future looks like, there can be nothing, nothing greater than to be blessed in the heavenlies because what that statement means is that everything was accomplished on the cross of Calvary of God's redemption for mankind and as a result of that, we are now separated, we are separated to live extraordinary lives because we have the Holy Spirit living within us and we come to the realization that we can't live the Christian life apart from him. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do to lose our salvation and he has given us everything we need to live godly lives in Christ. Everything we need, there's nothing lacking. There's nothing lacking. You ever bought something and you, maybe it was a toy at Christmas for your kids or, or, or something you bought and there's just a few things missing in the package. I recently bought something and I was all excited. It came in the mail and I, boy, I was looking forward to getting this thing and I went to put it all together and I'm like, these pieces don't fit with what I just bought. And I was, you know, you know how you're all excited about putting something together. Guys like to put something together, you know, most of the time. But anyway, so I was really disappointed. Well, eventually, after a few days, they sent me the right parts of what I was missing. But but to be able to put it all together and to be able to have all the proper pieces and have everything that is significant that you need to accomplish something is really a great gift. So God's given us all the tools, all the tools, and made it possible for us. We're blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Nothing is lacking. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. And what I shared last time too was the significance of the sacrifices that were brought in the Old Testament had to be blameless. They had to be the best of the best of the best. So when you brought an animal or you purchased an animal for sacrifice, it had to be uh, blameless. It had to be without blemish. It wasn't, let's get the sickest animal or, or whatever and bring it for a sacrifice. It had to be the very, very best. 
And so he, what God is saying is Jesus was, of course, his best, but now we are seen before God because of the sacrifice of Christ. We are now blameless. We are blameless. Isn't, isn't that the most wonderful feeling in the world to be blameless? That's like, that's like being able to say to it, when tax time comes around, you don't owe any taxes. In fact, the rest of your life, you won't have to pay any more taxes. Or like, you know, you get the publisher's clearinghouse, you know, you get this huge check and then so much of it they, goes to taxes. And so now you, you don't have to worry about taxes anymore. So it's, it's like, wow. So in, in our position in Christ, we don't have to worry about the sin issue anymore because it was dealt with on Calvary. Now, is God continuing to work in our lives? Oh, yeah. Do I still stumble and fall? Yeah. But the great thing is, is God sees me as forgiven. And so when I stumble and fall, and the enemy, he loves to do this when we stumble and fall, is to say, oh, you're never, you're never going to be able to beat, you, beat this. You're never going to be able to conquer this. Oh, really? When I focus on who Christ is and what he has done for me, there's nothing that separates us from the love of God. There's nothing that keeps us away from becoming conformed to the image of Christ because he has promised us. He has said, he has begun a good work in us. He is going to be faithful, and he is going to complete it. Does it say anything about you? No. It says it's all about him doing all the heavy lifting. And ladies and gentlemen, isn't that the best? Isn't isn't that the most wonderful place to be, to be in that position where I walk with a living, holy God who has made me blameless in his sight, and he's promised all of this, the future for me. I I can rely on that. I can depend upon that, and it gives me a hope. Because without, to have a faith, a religion that has no hope, it's a waste of time. And, and, it's, and it's purposeless. It's endless. It never, you can never cease to please, try to please God. And I was brought up in a religion where I never knew I could ever have pleased God no matter what I did, no matter what I ever did. Um, and so that is one of the greatest stories. Then in verse 5, he says this, He predestined us to be adopted as his sons, through Christ Jesus, in accordance with his pleasure and will. And I love the fact that it was God's pleasure that the grace of God that brought us to that point of understanding who he was, it was his great pleasure that he wanted us to redeem us back from a fallen world because we all were born into this world as sinners, separated from God. We were enemies of God. None of us sought God. None of us wanted anything to do with God. And yet... God brought us to that point at some point in our lives, sometimes it's his children. For me, I was 19, where I realized, you know what? I don't know what the meaning of life is. I don't really know what the purpose of life is. It's all kind of, like Solomon said, it's all kind of futile. It's all kind of meaningless, purposeless. What in the world am I here for? And then I came to that point where I understood that Jesus, who Jesus was, and everything changed in my life, and I began to realize, hmm, I got a purpose to live for now, and I have a peace and a freedom and a sense of purpose. Because everybody, everybody wants in this life to find what their purpose, what's my purpose? What was I made for? Is it just to get up, go to work, make money, buy a house, have a nice stuff, have a family, and then die someday? Is that it? I, I mean, it's all wonderful stuff, but is that it? If that's all there is, I mean, and we look at the world around us today, people are struggling to find the meaning and the purpose of life. The use of drugs is off the charts and everything else is off the charts today. It's off the charts. And tra- you know, when you travel, uh, being up in Canada and everything, and you see all the, all the crazy things that are going on and people and how lost people are. And we were people, I was people watching yesterday. We were in, uh, I, I can't remember, I was in so many places yesterday. Where, where were we yesterday? Uh, Halifax, Halifax, okay? And we flew out of that and we were there for a couple of days and we're down by the, the water and uh, the farmer's market, and just watch, people watching. Do you like the people watch? Boy, we're something, aren't we? I mean, you don't need to watch TV or anything. You just kind of go to these places and it's, woo, you know? I mean, it's like, wow. Um, yeah, it's just, anyway, where was I? I know exactly where I am. Thank you, thank you. According to the pleasure of his will. So in God's perfect plan and perfect will and perfect timing, he put us in a place where uh, we could find him. He put it there where we could seek him and we could find him, and it was by the grace of God drawing us to him. But it was through the word of God. Everybody came to know Jesus through the word of God. Everybody who's here this morning who has a personal relationship with the living God heard the word of God. And the word of God moved you. The word of God spoke to you. The word of God, the Holy Spirit of God convicted you of your need for God. Isn't that great? Aren't you glad he didn't leave you alone? 
Yeah, yeah, I'm so glad he doesn't leave me alone. He continually, um, in his loving presence, presses me and moves me and creates within me a desire to know him more and more. So next point, the blood, the mystery. Verse 16, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given. And, and this is, I love Paul saying this, it is all about to, the, to his praise of his glorious grace, and his grace is glorious, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In the one he loves, and that was through the person of Jesus Christ who became man and dwelt among us and was, became the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, all sin. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Isn't that amazing? He says, when, through his blood we have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. When you think of the riches of God's grace, when you try to envision the riches of his grace, when you think of a person who doesn't know the grace of God, who doesn't understand the grace of God, who has never come to an understanding of it's faith alone and Christ alone, period, in that relationship, you can't really understand the riches of his grace because when we see, what, when we see a life that is transformed, and some of us have been saved way too long, We've been saved way too long. And you know what I mean by that? It's we forgot. We have forgotten what we've been saved from. We forgot what it was like to be completely lost and without any direction, without any hope, without any purpose. We're just trying to, we have forgotten. And so as a result, sometimes we need to come back to that place where we get the overwhelming sense of who he is and who we weren't, and we see who, who we are now and we are overwhelmed by the riches of his grace. And that's something, ladies and gentlemen, we won't fully comprehend until we're in the presence of the living God. We won't fully grasp that until we are actually in the presence of him someday. Because we can't get our mind around it because we live in a fallen world. All we know is a fallen world. Okay? We don't know any more than living in a fallen world. But to be translated some days, and, and he talks about the millennial kingdom, we're going to get into that here in a minute, of, of what that would be like, or to be in the new Jerusalem. Wow. See, we, we can't even get, begin to get our mind around it, but there's so much good that awaits us. But you know what the best part is? We get to do something with it here and now. We get to do something with it here and now. So, look at this. Through the blood of the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. You think of the word lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. So, so the ability, when you think of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and you think somebody who's a baby Christian who understands some of the very fundamentals of the faith is wiser and much more intelligent than some of the greatest minds who've ever existed, you know, so at the airport, uh, the guy was looking at my passport. He said, are you related to, to Mr. Hawkins, you know? And I'm like, no, he's no relation. I want nothing to do with what he believes. Uh, but, it, but the reality is, is to, to be in this place where we understand what the greatness of understanding the truth of knowing Christ, the greatest riches ever. He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his good pleasure, which he has purposed in Christ. And again, in accordance to his will, with his good pleasure, it pleased him to give us this understanding, this ability, this capacity to understand spiritual truth. Because the unsaved mind can't grasp the things of God. But the, only the saved, regenerated mind can grasp the things of God. And what a gift that is. What a gift it is. Because to, to the world, the word of God is foolishness. To the world, God's words are foolish. But to the believer, their life, their life. I want to go back to something here, the significance of the blood of Christ. I just want to read a little bit about this because sometimes I kind of, we can kind of pass over the blood of Christ. I just want to kind of put it in context a little bit more for us this morning because I think it's important we take the time to talk about some of these key issues. What is the meaning of the blood of Christ? The answer, the phrase the blood of Christ is used several times in the New Testament and is the expression of sacrificial death and full atoning work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. 
References to the Savior's blood include the reality that he literally bled on the cross, but more significantly, that he bled and died for sinners. The blood of Christ has the power to atone for an infinite number of sins committed by an infinite number of people through the ages and whose faith rests in that blood will be saved. Isn't that amazing? Infinite number of sins through all the ages from the beginning of time to the very end of time. The work of Christ stands alone as the one thing eternal that made the difference between life and death for human beings. That was significant in the blood of Christ. The reality of this blood of Christ as a means of atonement for sin, has its origin in the Mosaic law. Once a year, the priest, was, um, the priest was to make an offering of the blood of animals at the altar of the temple for the sins of the people. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, Hebrews 9.22. But this was the blood offering that was limited in its effectiveness which is why it had to be offered again and again and again. This was a foreshadowing of the once for all sacrifice which Jesus offered on the cross, Hebrews 7, 27. Once that sacrifice was made, there was no longer a need for the blood of bulls and goats. Isn't that amazing? It was a picture, a type that God gave in the Mosaic law for people to understand there had to be a, a price paid for their sin. There had to be, the, for life to be given, there had to be death. There had to be death. And the death of these animals was a temporary picture, a foreshadowing of what Christ was going to do. But that was over and over and over and over again. When I, I saw a picture recently, when I was in Mexico, outside of Mexico, in the Aztec Empire, I remember standing on the grounds where they have these pyramids where they would have, they would go round up these tribes of people that were not part of this particular tribe in Mexico and they would have them stand chest to chest for like a mile and they would be led up to the top of the, the, the pyramid. They would have their hearts cut out and their bodies would be thrown down the side and, and the pyramids were covered with blood and these were sacrificed thousands and thousands and thousands of people were sacrificed on a regular basis. And, and it was something that when you see the picture and you see the size of these pyramids, people lined up and it was one sacrifice after other sacrifice. And you know what that did? It did nothing. These people's lives, they were sacrificed to some demonic deity, meant nothing. So when we think of that, when we think of these pyramids covered red with blood of humans, for what purpose? For what purpose? And then we think of the blood of one man, God-man, Jesus, who was sinless, atoned for all. Pretty, I, I mean, it was significant to stand there in, at this pyramid and, and stand at the top of the pyramid and just imagine this. This was, there was this brutality. In that empire, what happened to the Aztecs? They're gone. What happened to the Roman Empire? It was gone. So when we understand what stands, the word of God, the truth of Christ. So anyway, let me just move on here. The blood of Christ is the basis of the new covenant, the New Testament, the new covenant. That, that one night before he went to the cross, Jesus offered a cup of wine to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood which is poured out for you. And so we celebrate communion, we remember this. The pouring out of the wine in the cup symbolized the blood of Christ which would be poured out for all who would ever believe in him. When his shed blood on the cross it did away with the old covenant required for the continual sacrifices of animals, their blood was not significant to remove the sins of people, except on a temporary basis. It was covered temporarily. Because sin against a holy and infinite God requires, and I get this, a holy and infinite sacrifice. But those sacrifice were, sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins because it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, Hebrews 10.3. While the blood of bulls and goats was there as a reminder of sin, the precious, precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect, 1 Peter 1.19, paid the full debt of the sin to God that we owe. We need no, no, we need no longer sacrifices for sin. Jesus said it is finished. It is finished as he was dying. And he meant just that. The entire work of redemption was forever completed, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See Hebrews 9, 12. Not only does the blood of Christ redeem us from sin and eternal punishment, but his blood will make our consciences pure from useless acts. I love that. So many may serve a living God. 
This means that not only are we only free from having to offer sacrifices which are useless to obtain salvation, but we are free from having to rely on worthless and unproductive works of the flesh to please God. This is such great truth, folks, because in, in, in our minds, we think that we have to please God. We have to, even though after we're saved, we have to somehow pay God back or something I'm going to do is significant apart from him or, or somehow if I feel guilty enough or somehow I work hard enough or I pray harder or I give more, I'm going to somehow feel more freed from the bondage of sin. It doesn't work that way because the blood of Christ has redeemed us. We are now new creations, new creations. We are new in Christ 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And by his, by his blood we are freed from sin to serve the living God and to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. Now think about that just for a second. To be able to enjoy God forever. That's some pretty crazy stuff, isn't it? To think that the God who created all things, the God who sustains all things, the God who's able to move, I had a little fun on this trip. We went to this place called the Bay of Fundy, and uh, the tides are going uh, like 40, 50 feet high. I mean, when, when the tide goes out, the tide goes out. When the tide comes in, the tide comes in. And uh, so we were there in the morning when the tide was in. It was pretty cool. But when we came back later that day, the tide was out. We went out and walked on the bottom of the ocean, and I picked up a stick, and I held it like this. Marianne took a... You remember Moses, the Ten Commandments? Anyway, it was... It was one of those moments I was fooling around. I'm not Moses, I know that. But, but, anyway, but, but what took me back was when you see, it kind of gave us a sense of what it must have been like to cross on the Red Sea because we were walking where on like 30 feet, 40 feet below where the ocean had been just a few hours before. We were walking on dry ground. It was pretty cool. And it made me realize the, how awesome God is and that how with the movement of, of the earth and the moon and the gravitational pull and how tides come in and tides go out, how God is in control. And even though we have disasters and things, God is in control. And, and I saw that and I, and, and I stood there with a sense of awe for a minute. And I was just thinking to myself how little we are, how small we are, and yet our God purposely has chosen to redeem us individually by name. He knows our names. He knows who we are. He knows our address. He knows our email address. He sees our tweets. He knows our tweets. Isn't it amazing that the God of all this would care about us and, and send his son to die for us, these little specks, little specks, just amazing. So let me just close with this idea of, of enjoying him forever. I got just a couple minutes. I'm going to try to move through here. To be put into, let me, let me just go back here a second. In accordance to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, verse 10, to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So this idea of a mystery here is talking about the headship of Christ, the millennial reign that we talk about in the Bible, but there's going to be this thousand-year reign where Jesus is going to fulfill the prophecy and sit on the throne of David and rule and reign here on earth. Can you imagine what that's going to be like to have Jesus Christ ruling and reigning here on earth and to be part of that and to live in an environment where God truly is ruling and reigning here on earth? Now, God is in control of all things on earth and heaven and earth, but to be able to see and envision and come to, to comprehension that Jesus has fulfilled the prophecy that he promised he would fulfill when he would come to earth and rule and reign. How the Jews missed it, how most of the world has missed it, but there will come that time where all things, all things will come together and it'll be a fulfillment of prophecy and it'll be something that this world has never seen before. There'll be a one world government there'll be one who is in control of all things living here on earth, fulfilling the prophecies that he prophesied. You see, God is not slack regarding his promises or his prophecies. Everything that he said he's going to do, he's going to do. There's no question about it. We trust each other. We, have to, we make covenants with each other. We sign contracts. We break contracts every day. Uh, the scripture tells us uh, to make your yay be yay and your nay be nay. That means nothing in our world today. Culture, our culture we live in, it means nothing, but it does mean something with our God. So let me just close with this. Verse 11, in him 
We were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Then he goes on to say in 13, And youth Gentiles also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what that happened, what, ha- what happens with that and what I look at this is this opportunity that God gave us in our time in our life to repent. That the gospel came to the Jews, many of the Jews rejected it, many, many believed, but then it came to the Gentiles, which the Jews never understood or believed. And here's the beauty of it all. The Jews were to be the light of the world. They were given the Torah. They were given the light. They were given the prophets. They were given the Messiah. They were to be the light of the world in which others would come to know the living God. We as Gentiles, as believers in Christ, get to carry that mantle, that torch of letting the world be known who Jesus is and the good news of the gospel. But he says here that we were the first, they were the first to hope, but we have this hope that we were included in this, the word of truth, the gospel. Just think about that for a second, the word of truth. What, out of all the things that you have ever learned, out of all the things that you have ever come to understand in all your life, whatever disciplines you've studied, whatever truths you may know to be true, there's nothing but the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can transform a person's life. Nothing. There's nothing. You can be cured from cancer, you can survive surgeries, you can survive heart attacks and strokes and on and on and on. There's nothing but the gospel of Christ that can completely transform a person's life and bring them from death to life. Isn't that amazing? That is, is, ladies and gentlemen, that is the greatest gift, the greatest gift that we could ever have, mankind could ever have. And we get to be part of that here in this church. So I want to encourage you to invite your friends. I want to encourage to have the kids invite their kids out to a, to a wana. We get that privilege with working with the kids, our small children here. Youth group, we get to work with that, with adults, with Sunday school. We have the freedom to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the only thing that can completely and utterly transform a person's life. Isn't that amazing? I'm always in awe of that. I'm, I'm truly in awe of that, that God entrusted you and me with these truths. Isn't that scary? That's a little bit scary because, man, there's times I can't even carry my coffee across the room without spilling it. You know, I mean, seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm pretty incompetent. Doesn't that make you feel good? Um, but but the, reality, the reality is he gives us this wonderful truth to proclaim the most wonderful, magnificent truth that has ever been proclaimed ever in this world from the beginning of time to the very end of time. The gospel of Christ, the Bible is Christ-centric. And it's either, either Jesus is coming or Jesus has come. And what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with that this week? Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you. We recognize the truth of the gospel and how you give us this privilege of just saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. I can't do this. I can't live the Christian life. I can't save myself. In fact, the way I'm living sometimes, Lord, I wonder what, I'm, what I even believe. But God, you are there to um, help us to see who we are in you and what you've done for us, that you see us as your adopted children, that you sent Christ on a rescue mission to save us. And so by putting our trust in what Christ did, recognizing we're sinners and we repent, I say, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, and that I can't save myself. So I accept the gift of salvation by the death, burial, and resurrection, the perfect shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then given the spirit, the seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the deposit, he guaranteed our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Father, thank you for making us your possession. Thank you for making us your children. Thank you for dying for us, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for sealing us. Father, thank you for loving us with a love that we will never fully understand, that agape love. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.